And let's go ahead and get started. My name is Roosevelt Grant, and today, welcome to the webinar on energy efficiency and renewable energy. We have quite a bit of folks who are participating today, so the webinar will, will be limited to listen mode only. Today's webinar will be recorded. The recorded webinar, the slides, and the transcript will be posted onto HUD Exchange at a later date. In terms of webinar instructions, please submit any questions that you may have, either for the content or for technical issues to the Q&A box. We will monitor that and make sure that we try to address as many questions as possible at the end of this webinar presentation. If you have any technical questions, please submit those again to the Q&A box, and our host will monitor those and assist. Uh, before I continue, I'd like to acknowledge Ms. Joshani Clemens, who is our host today, and she's been very instrumental in providing us with assistance. Thank you, Joshani. With that, I'd like to present our, our title, Mitigating Natural Hazard Risk in the Energy Sector, Opportunities for HUD CBDG MIT Grantees to learn best practices for energy efficiency, energy storage, and renewable. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Jen Carpenter for a few comments. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today, and thank you, Roosevelt. Um, again, my name is Jen Carpenter. I'm the Assistant Director of Policy for the Disaster Recovery and Special Issues Division here at HQ in DC. Um, thanks for joining us today. We're glad we could all meet virtually to take up uh, the first webinar in our CDBG MIT webinar series. Um, we're happy to have our colleagues from FEMA. <clears throat> for those of you don't, who don't know, Roosevelt Grant, who started the, the webinar today, he's been heading up um, the series he's doing, working on a detail with HUD um, in the Disaster Recovery and Special Issues Division. So it's been great having him and his knowledge from FEMA, and I think you'll see um, how great these webinars are going to be in this series, and it's, real, it's a really great focus on coordinate, coordinating with our other federal partners. Um, so we're happy to have DOE with us today, and then we'll be working with um, other folks from FEMA on the rest of the series, and then other divisions at DOE. So I think you guys will get an interesting perspective throughout this webinar series, a little different than you would get from the HUD side. So I think it's always good for for you guys to hear from from federal partners, especially with this, um, you know, with our CDBG MIT funds and the unique aspect of those funds. So thanks again for joining, and I'll throw it back over to Roosevelt. Thank you, Jen. So we're going to do some quick introductions of the presenters. First, I'd like to introduce Ms. Crystal Lehman, who is with the U.S. Department of Energy. Crystal serves in their Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, which focuses on clean energy strategies for states, localities, and utilities. She formerly worked at the U.S. EPA in the Climate Change Division and the United Nations Office of Disaster Risk Reduction. So thank you, Crystal, for joining us today. We have Ms. Jana Gannon, who is with the Blue Lake Renteria Tribe in, North, in Northern California. Um, Jana is the Sustainability and Government Affairs Director and she is a nationally recognized leader in the field of energy efficiency and renewable energy. She helps to establish and implement the Blue Lake Renteria Tribe's energy strategy, and this includes working to reduce the, the tribe's carbon footprint, reduce the cost of energy, and then also increasing resiliency. I'd like to also introduce Ms. Michaela Katani, who is with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. 
She's a CPD specialist in policy under HUD's Disaster Recovery and Special Issues Division. Thanks a lot. And as Jen introduced me, my name is Roosevelt Grant. I'm with the Department of Homeland Security in FEMA, and I am on a temporary assignment to support the policy unit in the Disaster Recovery and Special Issues Division. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover today in this webinar. First, we'll provide you with a background looking at CDBG NIT purpose and goals. We'll take a look at the community lifeline, particularly energy. We'll look at covered projects and CDBG NIT eligible activities. We'll look at examples of energy efficiency and renewable energy for disaster mitigation projects. We'll take a look at energy efficiency and energy ren renewable energy practices, best practices through Blue Link Lecturia. We'll take a look at the value of including energy efficiency and renewable energy in action plans. We'll provide you with a summary and then also resources for your benefit going forward. And lastly, we'll look at some questions and answers. So with that, I'd like to Turn it over to Michaela. Thanks, Roosevelt. Um, so first, we're going to get into the purpose of your CDBG MIT grant. Um, so for us, mitigation is a unique set of funding um, for you all in the sense that this funding really focuses on carrying out strategic and high impact activities to mitigate against disasters and reduce those future losses. Um, so this is where our grant for mitigation differs from your typical disaster recovery funds that qualified you in getting this mitigation grant. So first of all, all of your activities must meet the definition of mitigation. And mitigation is the kind where activities are used to increase resiliency to disasters and reduce or eliminate the long-term risks of loss of life, injury, damage to, and loss of property, and suffering and hardship by lessening the impact of future disasters. Then you have your mitigation needs assessment where you are identifying both of your current and future risks in your most impacted and distressed areas. Third, your activities must be CDBG eligible or eligible through a waiver and alternative requirement. And here, your CDBG MIT grants generally have the same eligible activities as CDBG DR as far as housing infrastructure, public services, and economic revitalization. There are some differences here, um, especially with this emphasis to increase resiliency and reduce risks. Uh, a big one is overall benefit objective is lowered to 50% low and moderate income persons rather than your typical 70% LMI benefit. Lastly, all of your activities must meet a national objective which for the most part, again, is the same as CDBG EDR. Um, we did eliminate the slum and blight national objective options, but if you would like to use this national objective, you can always make that waiver request. Additionally, we have added two extra criteria for your national objective in mitigation. The first one being that urgent need for mitigation uh, this is a little different than your normal urgent need national objective because it is used in this forward-looking mindset for your activities. So if you plan on using this national objective, you need to address the current and future risks that you've identified, which you are kind of already doing anyway. Um, and then secondly, how this activity will result in a measurable and verifiable reduction in the loss of life. And then we also have added covered projects where Roosevelt is going to dive a little deeper into this piece shortly. 
Again, for all of your activities to meet a national objective, you must be to show you have considered and planned for long-term operations and maintenance of your projects. Then you must also show that all your activities are consistent and working together to mitigate risks. And really, this is making sure that none of your projects will have an adverse effect in any of your other areas. And in the sense that we are naming these as a requirement, uh, but you're like already taking this into account in your regular CDBG DR program. Next, uh, this slide is showing a few of HUD's goals with the mitigation funding um, and really the policy objectives behind this funding. Um, where we're, we're really wanting you guys to rely on data-informed investments, especially where there have been repetitive losses, as well as building capacity to analyze and address disaster risks and update those hazard mitigation plans. There is also this piece where we are putting an emphasis on supporting the adoption of policies that reflect both of your local and regional priorities to have long-lasting effects in risk reduction. And then, of course, maximizing the impact of these funds by encouraging leveraging and partnerships. So mitigation needs assessment. These are different than your typical disaster recovery needs assessment because you are looking at your current and future risks and then determining how you can do, um, how, how and what you can do to reduce them uh, rather than filling a gap in your unmet needs. So these are risk-based assessments where risks can be assessed both quantitatively and qualitatively through a variety of methods. But generally, you're going to be looking at your hazards and comparing it to your community assets. So typically, you will want to look at those historical patterns as well as some of those scenario-based analysis. And you can use these exercises to determine what your most significant risks are as well as other significant vulnerabilities in your system, and then use this information to determine what your mitigation strategy looks like. Another consideration uh, when you're looking at those vulnerabilities are those indispensable services that can be affected during a disaster. When you figure out what your activities are that can help reduce those risks, it can really push the acceleration of your recovery following a disaster. So this can really be thought of as looking at those functions that are critical businesses, those essential government functions, and other critical services to human health, safety, and economic security. And in doing this, you can kind of look at FEMA's seven critical service areas or the, their lifelines. And so with that, I am going to turn it over to Roosevelt, where he will go over FEMA's lifeline and transition us into energy and why this is so important. Thanks a lot, Michaela. So last October, FEMA published the National, National Response Framework, and that framework updated information from FEMA on the importance of community lifelines. So the next few slides here will address that in a little bit more detail. So that national response framework uh, was an opportunity for, free, for FEMA to provide recommendations uh, to allow a community to rapidly stabilize their lifelines after a disaster. At a high level, uh, lifelines can be described as the most basic functions that allow a community to function or operate. These basic functions allow the continuous operation of, of critical government and business functions, and as Michaela has mentioned in her presentation, are essential to protecting human health and safety and promoting economic stability. 
Now, I know that uh, Jana and Crystal will note some of this in their presentations later, but community lifelines, particularly energy, often intersect. And as Michaela noted, there are seven lifelines. We have safety and security, food, water, sheltering, health and, health and medical. We have energy, which we'll talk about in the next slide. We have communication, transportation, and then hazardous materials. And one of the things I want to point out is that underneath each of these seven lifelines, there are critical components that comprise, comprise that particular lifeline. So going from right to left under transportation, we have the highway, roadway systems, mass transit, and aviation. Uh, for communication, we have, for example, infrastructure, 911. Um, for health and medical, we have that health care supply chain. Uh, for food, water, sheltering, we have the distribution, that supply chain there, and then agriculture. Last, we have safety and security, and that looks at government services, fire service, as well as law enforcement. Again, I would strongly encourage you to take a look at that August, October uh, 2019 document that FEMA published, the fourth edition of the National Response Framework. And that has a lot more detail for your benefit with respect to the community lifeline. So drilling down a little bit more here on energy lifelines, we have these three blue boxes, the power grid, temporary power, fuel. Certainly for the power grid, the power generation, transmission, and distribution are impacted under that. Critical facilities fall under temporary power and the ability to have redundant power is very critical to maintaining the operation. And then having the right field resources to meet your need for power generation is extremely important. So as you look at these boxes here and think through your particular risk assessment for your community, uh, certainly you want to take a look at where are your vulnerable spots for your power grid. How can you develop potential mitigation activities to address that? Um, for temporary power, again, ensuring that you have the continuation of your critical services both before, during, and after a disaster is highly important. And then clearly making sure that you have fuel resources to meet your needs also is important. And we'll be getting into a little bit more detail with that um, when uh, Crystal and Jana uh, take over the webinar. So again, for more information, more in-depth information about these community lifelines and particular energy, I would encourage you to take a look at that August, that October uh, 2019 document on the National Response uh, Framework uh, that will have more information on that. I had an opportunity to spend some time in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria hit uh, that island. And one of the things that really struck me is how interconnected, how intersect, how these community lifelines intersect, and particularly with energy. And so this, this slide here is just trying to kind of illustrate that connectivity. So thinking about power generation, transmitting that power, distributing that power, in the context for Puerto Rico, um, they had some long-standing historical problems and vulnerabilities with their energy uh, lifeline. And so after Hurricane Maria hit, um, those vulnerabilities were certainly manifest in terms of communications, telecommunications, government services were significantly impacted. The ability to move goods, uh, that supply chain was extremely in inhibited, uh, certainly the long-term impacts from Maria were exacerbated by the failure of their lifeline in some respects to be able to help support their food, water, and sheltering lifeline. And then clearly there's documented evidence of some of the impacts of energy in terms of affecting health and medical. So uh, we are working with the island, FEMA, and other federal partners, both public and private, uh, to try to help bring a whole community approach solution to some of their challenges. Uh, but I just wanted to kind of like bring attention to this uh, slide in a way as you're thinking through some of the information that Michaela talked about in terms of leveraging uh, mitigation plans 
and incorporating that information into your mitigation needs assessment. I'm going to focus a little bit on covered projects and then some eligible MIT activities. So the definition for, as HUD describes, for covered projects is an infrastructure project having a total project cost of $100 million or more with at least $50 million or so of CDBG through either MIT, DR funds, or NDR funds made available. The U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico have a lower dollar threshold for what constitutes a covered project. Uh, so because this is a unique activity here, I wanted to give you a little bit more context. So from the August 30th, 2019 Federal Register Notice, uh, there's a lot of great information in, in that Federal Register Notice, but I'm just going to give you a very quick summary of it. Infrastructure projects are defined further as being an activity or group of related activities that are designed to provide or support services in various sectors, such as water, energy, and transportation. Other considerations for a covered project, grantees must submit the covered project in an action plan or in a substantial amendment to the action plan. Covered projects must meet the definition of a mitigation activity. They must be eligible under CDBG. They must, as Michaela has noted, uh, pro covered projects must address current and future risks in the mid area. Again, identify in a mitigation needs assessment. The action plan uh, must also describe how the covered project will meet the national objective and some examples of this include looking at the long-term efficacy and fiscal sustainability aspect. And doing that will entail looking at the useful life of the project, addressing operations and maintenance. The covered project will need to have some form of cost-benefit analysis. And then the project needs to be documented as being consistent with other mitigation activities in that most distressed and, and most impacted and stressed area. So again, for more context, more information on covered projects, recommend that you take a look at that August 30th, 2019 Federal Register Notice. And then there was a webinar that uh, Jen Carpenter and Frank McNally did that looked at CDBG MIT requirements and also covered projects connected to that uh, August 2019 Federal Register Notice. There are some potential eligibility uh, allowances for, for covered projects, or that particularly look at energy projects. Here we have examples of green building standards, such as Energy Star, LEED, and the National Green Building Standards. Other considerations include distributed energy resources. And so from there, we've got microgrids, solar, and storage, and, and Crystal and Jan Jana will cover those in more detail. One other thing, uh, we will have a webinar next month that will look more into resilient buildings and leveraging energy efficiency and renewable energy for that. Uh, Crystal will get into that in her presentation. Um, but in terms of being able to le leverage energy efficiency and renewable energy, these technologies can benefit shelters, schools, hospitals, police stations, and other uh, critical infrastructure as defined by grantees in their action plan. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and, and move forward and turn it over to Crystal. Thank you. Thank you, Roosevelt. Just give me a quick sound check so Joshana can give me the green light. Can you hear me OK? Perfect. OK. Hello, my name is Crystal Lehman, a policy advisor at the, the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy at the U.S. Department of Energy. Thank you to my colleagues at HUD for inviting me to speak today. During this presentation, I will be showcasing various examples of energy efficiency and renewable energy projects that have been funded by the U.S. Department of Energy to mitigate against natural disasters. I will also highlight the value of energy efficiency and renewable energy and show examples of how CDBG MIT grantees 
are already using energy efficiency and renewable energy into the required CDBG MIT action plans. Roosevelt briefly mentioned this. This is just one part of a DOE webinar series. For those that are interested, you should consider participating in the future energy-related webinars. Before I dive in, I wanted to give a high-level overview of U.S. Department of Energy and where my office sits. There are many different offices within DOE, and the information I'll be presenting comes from the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, which is highlighted here on the screen. The Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy includes various technology topics with the vision of supporting a strong and prosperous America powered by clean, affordable, and secure energy. In particular, the Weatherization and Intergovernmental Office supports a program called the State Energy Program, also known as SEP. SEP is a DOE program that provides funding and technical assistance to 56 states, territories, and the District of Columbia to enhance energy security, advance state-led energy initiatives, and maximize the benefits of increasing energy efficiency. DOE primarily works with the state's designated energy office and has seen state-led efforts to increase resiliency. I will be talking through examples of two resiliency projects, one in Puerto Rico and one in Florida, both funded by SEP. To receive SEP funding, the program requires that state energy offices submit an annual plan to DOE that reflects energy emergency-related activities the state is plan to, planning to undertake for the fiscal year. States can use SEP formula grants funded to develop and execute emergency energy plans in relation to energy. My first example will cover how Puerto Rico responded after a major disaster and decided to utilize energy efficiency and renewable energy to respond and mitigate against disasters. Hurricane Maria, a Category 4 hurricane, made landfall in Puerto Rico in 2017. These storms brought powerful winds, storm surges, and major flooding. The Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority, PREPRA, the utility that's in Puerto Rico, reported that over a million of its electricity customers were without power immediately after Hurricane Maria. In the aftermath of Hurricane Maria, Puerto Rico began, began developing a residential energy resiliency solar program for its residents and community. The objective of the program was to not only reduce energy consumption from the grid in selected homes, but to also establish resiliency for the families whose homes had been affected by the hurricane. In 2018, a total of $239,000 of SEP funds were invested into this program. Each of the PV systems installed into the homes cost about $12,000. As part of the installation, the components included PV modules, module racks, charge controllers, inverters, and of course, battery storage. Puerto Rico created selection criteria for the program to determine which homes can participate in the project. To participate in the project, homes had to be previously weatherized by the Weatherization Assistance Program's Puerto Rico program, located out of flooding zones, located in areas of extreme vulnerability in the energy grid, been without power for more than 60 days, and agreed to voluntarily send monthly electricity bills to be evaluated. This project contributed to energy resiliency within Puerto Rico by creating security in the home when families needed to shelter in place during the disaster response. In addition, the project will help mitigate future disasters by maintaining reliable power. With 2.7 kilowatts for each home, the project provided 54 kilowatts overall for the 20 homes selected for the program. 
A reduction of an average of 10 to 15 kilowatts per hour per month has been recorded on the project per home. As part of the qualitative assessment, Puerto Rico has asked participants about the benefits they have seen since having the system installed. Most participants answered that they feel safer, and they also feel confident in having electricity uh, even in a natural event, even in the case that a natural event may occur. In two cases where elderly people lived in the home, they commented that the project was a relief. This project allowed for passive survivability and reliable power to the homes, especially when the families needed to shelter in place during a disaster. This project was recently highlighted through a joint DOE-FEMA webinar, which illustrated that FEMA's benefit cost analysis made it eligible for FEMA's upcoming Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities, also known as BRIC, which will be focused on mitigation. You can find this webinar on FEMA and DOE's website, respectively. Many energy efficiency and renewable energy projects are eligible, eligible for BRICS program because it meets eligibility requirements and is a cost-effective technology to mitigate against disasters. This next project came from Florida's interest to become more resilient in an event of a natural disaster and strengthen the community by installing solar and battery storage to schools designated as an emergency shelter during a disaster. When a disaster strikes, people may need to leave their homes or seek a resource that is open to the community. Keeping these facilities online with power is essential. The project, called SunSmart Schools eShelters, E for Emergency, cost, cost roughly $9 million and leveraged nearly a million from Florida utilities to complete the installation and provide solar education kits. Florida successfully outfitted 117 schools with solar systems throughout the state. The total capacity installed was about one megawatt, which produced an average of 12 megawatt hours annually. The project installed by module solar systems, which can operate in either grid connected or standalone mode and use battery storage. The key difference in the bi module system is the invert setup, invert setup, which draws DC, direct current power, from the battery system instead of from the solar array. In addition, when the school is not used as a shelter, the project became a teaching tool for teachers and students alike to learn about renewable energy technology, as you can see from this photo here. The project was put to work during four different hurricanes. For example, in 2017, once it became clear that Hurricane Irma's path was headed to Florida, the state moved into action. 40 SunSmart school e-shelters were activated. The storm intensified, and even when 32 of the schools lost power, they utilized the battery packup generator and stayed online. The solar system provided more than 10 hours of power during, until the grid was fully restored. It is a successful story of how renewable energy plus storage can be used to mitigate a disaster. These systems provide power to the critical loads during emergencies, as well as offset day-to-day -day electricity cost. The primary goal of this project was to provide adequate shelter for, for Floridians in the event of a disaster. However, the supplementary benefits are seen too. The SunSmart program has an energy cost saving for the school and has successfully taught students and teachers about renewable energy technology. And with that, those are my two examples. I will pass it to Jana Ganyan from Blue Lake Rancheria Tribe. Thank you, Crystal. Um, this is a quick mic check. Everyone can hear me okay? Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry about that. So um, I'm delighted to be joining this discussion. Um, it's super exciting, and I hope that um, you are all as well and as healthy as possible as we deal with this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it's hit tribal nations hard, 
and we're all working to manage the impacts, which are, of course are on top of long-term infrastructure deficiencies in tribal lands um, from, uh, from decades and decades ago. So my presentation today will hopefully be a bit of a break from all that and hopefully be of use to um, those that are considering microgrids as part of their energy resilience strategy. I'm going to talk about uh, strategic energy planning context the tribe um, has used and developed because it, it's really key to the investment and other decision making um, by the tribal council um, that then allows us to do these projects. And then we'll look at the details of the microgrid systems themselves and how they are all working um, operationally and financially. And a little bit of a case study uh, of the microgrid's performance in a recent disaster. So just to get started um, on a sense of place, um, the Blue Lake Rancheria Tribe is located in far northwestern California. It's rural and geographically pretty isolated here. Um, the tribe was first recognized in 1908, terminated for a period of time in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, and restored in, the, in 1983. And um, since restoration, it's been rebuilding and today has a portfolio of economic enterprises um, and is one of the top 10 largest employers in the region. Um, specific to energy, I think one key thing to note is that the tribe formed the Utility Authority in 2013, which manages energy, water, telecom, fuels, and other utilities for the community. Um, I'm not going to go into detail here, but I just want to highlight um, that partnerships and networking are core to the tribe's resilience strategy. And though it's a small tribal nation, the Blue Lake Rancheria is engaged in designing climate smart resilience uh, policy and programs with other tribal nations and with local, state, federal, and international stakeholders. I'm going to talk for a few slides about our investment rationale. Um, I'm going to start with the global and work and downscale from there. Um, the tribe's investment in its infrastructure projects has the climate crisis at its core. There are some climate data points globally on temperature increases and um, what impacts we are seeing uh, globally are already um, causing extreme issues on the ground and the, and the um, climate crisis and the global warming temperature increases are accelerating. The, um, the core consideration that the tribal government um, thinks about is that you know, we have to coordinate and work together to decarbonize the planet. We need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions like carbon dioxide. Um, and that is really one of the core tenets of our resilience strategy. And why is that? Well, because global climate um, impacts and amplifies our local conditions. Um, so we are already seeing um, amplification of dangerous and destructive issues on the ground. For example, we're seeing wildfires where they've never been. Um, we're in the midst of an ongoing drought that's lasted for a decade even in the temperate coastal regions of Northern California. Um, we are now uh, experiencing regional power shutoffs that are estimated um, and could last up to 10 days or even longer. And these are necessary to prevent wildfire because of the dry uh, conditions. And we are five miles inland from the Pacific coast in a temperate area, and so again, Historically, we've never seen conditions like these. Um, many of our typical issues are becoming more and more frequent. So landslides are increasingly common. Um, we, um, we are seeing supply disruptions and 
um, other supply chain disruptions multiple times a year. This includes, uh, importantly, diesel shipments, which impact both our transportation sector but also our backup diesel generators. So really, when we think about emergency power, the tribe can't rely solely, at least, on diesel for these critical needs. Um, and then uh, Humboldt County has the fastest sea level rise, net sea level rise on the Pacific coast because of uh, climate change and um, geologic uh, conditions here. And this will inundate our local natural gas power plant in approximately 10 years, and with it, a, a nuclear waste repository that's co-located on site. So when Roosevelt was talking about all of those overlapping issues that, um, that he saw in Puerto Rico, we, um, and, and probably m all of you on this call, have, have some combination of those in your own local area as well. And lastly, I'll just say we are in earthquake country. Um, we can have very large earthquakes here. And so relying on infrastructure such as natural gas pipelines is not practical. Our region, is, for example, is served by one 10-inch natural gas pipeline um, that will very likely be ruptured uh, probably indefinitely during um, any sort of Cascadia subduction zone earthquake event. So, you know, why am I talking about all this? Because it's important to um, get the context so that your decision making is really well informed, of course. And um, the Blue Lake Rancheria is building climate smart, self-reliant infrastructure as fast as possible. The benefits are, are, are proven um, and they include more resilience in the face of unexpected disasters. Um, they result in better community health. There are um, economy-enabling benefits. Um, these infrastructure investments reduce costs, increase the skill sets within the tribal staff, um, create new jobs uh, for tribal members and regionally, and generally um, just contribute to the economic activity in the region. Uh, microgrids are a part of uh, our lifeline sector strategy we focus on five of those, um, energy, water, transportation, communications, um, and food, with the idea that if we do all those well, community health and wellness, including economic wellness, will be enhanced. And of course, the, the lifeline sectors all overlap in many ways, as, uh, as Roosevelt was saying as well. Uh, however, we started with energy because it supports all the others. And the tribe has developed specific plans and long-term strategies for this, um, and those include, but are not limited to, a climate adaptation plan, a strategic energy plan, a community economic development strategy, and various, of course, hazard mitigations and other hazard mitigation plan and other emergency plans. Um, and our planning efforts uh, um, vary. Um, concertedly involve government departments, tribal members and community, economic enterprises, and then uh, an array of external stakeholders. And all of this is um, encompassed in our overarching goal, which is to achieve zero net greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. And we do this by um, making our infrastructure more robust and reducing greenhouse gases at the same time. So we pair mitigation, which is reducing GHGs, and adaptation, which is dealing with these impacts that we're already experiencing. Um, we pair those things always in our decision making. Um, it takes some discipline at first, but then once you, you get used to it, it's easy. <laughs> so specifics about the microgrids. Um, we have two solar and battery storage microgrids in operation at the Blue Lake Rancheria, and we have two more in development. Um, we are also looking at expanding the microgrids we do have in terms of adding more solar and battery storage. I'll talk about the community scale first because it's been in operation the longest. 
Um, this powers the government offices and economic enterprises, including a casino, hotel, several restaurants, um, and other buildings, including an event center that is also certified to operate as a Red Cross shelter in times of need. I want to make sure that I stress how we have worked to develop public-private partnerships for these technical projects. We work very closely with our local university, Humboldt State, and the Schatz Energy Research Center there, which provides integration engineering and other project assistance um, for these complicated microgrids. Integration engineering, having an expert lead engineer for the project is crucial. And if any of the listeners out there want more information on that, please email me and I'll, I'll be happy to, to have individual conversations. The California Energy Commission is a major funder and we've worked with over six national labs, including Idaho National Lab, Lawrence Berkeley, NREL, and others on these projects. We also work with a broad array of federal, state, and local emergency agencies, um, FEMA, Cal OES, um, Office of Emergency Services, the Red Cross, many others. And we do this to coordinate and align resilience efforts with um, emergency planning as well as normal operation planning. Our regional utility is Pacific Gas and Electric, uh, PG&E, and they've been excellent to work with. And a note, um, if your microgrid will be connected to the regional grid, I recommend establishing relationships with your utility partner or partners early and often. <laughs> Can't stress that enough. If you're going to be connected to their grid, there's a lot of safety and coordination um, and benefit that can be realized by um, that kind of a um, um, strategic partnership. Um, so the microgrid is tied to the larger regional grid, but it can disconnect from and reconnect to that grid when needed. So um, when it's disconnected, it's called in it being an islanded mode. And um, when it's disconnected or islanded, it uses 420 kilowatts AC of sol solar um, photovoltaics and two megawatt hours of battery storage with legacy diesel generators that are used um, only as needed to generate the power we need um, in that community grid for as long as we need to. So we can go months at a time disconnected from the larger grid. It's a great feeling. Um, and it's a testament to how far these technologies have developed. Um, we, the system is controlled by a centralized management system that allows us to do, you know, to control the islanding events, to um, shed loads that we don't need to conserve energy if we know the outage is going to be of a long duration, et cetera. We save about $200,000 per year on energy costs and we reduce greenhouse gases by about 200 tons a year as well. The other microgrid we have in, um, just to give another example of a different scale, uh, the other one we have in operation is um, a facility microgrid. Um, it's also uh, powered by solar PV and battery storage. Um, this microgrid is also a partnership uh, between, you know, the extraordinary energy leaders we have um, at, at the uh, local, state, and federal level um, and within the tribal community and is meant to prove up a resilience package for these kinds of small commercial buildings which do provide critical services to the community. Um, Advanced building controls for this project are going to be working in concert with the power generation and storage to improve the energy efficiency of the building and reduce costs for the tribe, allowing uh, as well for, for that islanding capability from the larger grid and robust emergency power. So, How's it working? Well, um, last October, we had our first extended 
uh, preventative power outage, um, that it was meant to uh, prevent wildfires from starting from the electrical grid. This outage on October 9th, 2019, impacted 30 counties um, and millions of people across Northern California and lasted for multiple days. Um, with the microgrids allowing for continuity of operations, the tribe was able to stay operational, keep business and services open, and provide critical services to the community. Estimates are that we served over 10% of the region with our campus providing supplies um, such as and, and other um, services like refrigeration to keep food and medicines cold, electric vehicle charging, fuels for emergency response agencies, and most critically, we were able to provide housing in our hotel for people who needed uh, powered medical devices. The local Department of Health credited the tribe with saving four lives during that event. And all of this was because we were able to keep the power on. Um, and of course, our Office of Emergency Services had planned well, but that's a different discussion. So um, microgrids as solutions, uh, they do create a lot of benefits. As we discussed, um, they are still leading edge technology in that each will be somewhat customized for its site and power loads and operational needs. Um, so the complexity of the microgrid will need to be matched to internal capacity to build, commission, and operate it. So we found, for example, that our IT teams were as involved as our electrical and facilities teams because of the software and the control systems um, and digital communications and other components that were necessary to, um, uh, to bring the system online. And it does save us money on electrical bills. Um, however, operating a utility and electrical system uh, is a big endeavor. And some of the things that helped make that a success strategically is that the tribal government took a patient payback approach for its investment it looks at infrastructure investments with a 10 to 20 year payback, um, and the tribal government was prepared to fund contingencies for these projects. Um, we value the microgrid in several ways. Obviously, continuity of operations is crucial, reaching our climate target. In normal operations, we want to reduce costs. It helps us hedge against future energy cost increases. Um, it clears the air uh, and improves tribal member health. And um, in emergency operations, it allows us to be able to exert more control over our response and recovery, um, which uh, is uh, maybe one of the most important aspects. So this slide, I guess, is just um, we don't have time today to go into project flow chart, but this gives some consideration for how to approach microgrids. I'll stress the importance of an expert integration engineer or engineering team again. Um, uh, microgrids, as I said, are not out of the box yet. Um, so in feasibility, design, and construction, and then for the lifetime of the system in operation and maintenance, um, the internal capacities um, will matter, and as well as reasonable and affordable access to uh, contractors and other service providers that will help maintain the system. Um, government and project structures, such as the utility authority, project management, LLCs, other kind of business structures will be important to explore. And lastly, I'll say that in our case, microgrids have been addictive they've worked well, <laughs> and so we are immediately expanding them. So uh, one recommendation is to um, include phased expansion plans, maybe adding more solar, adding more battery storage. Include that right up front so you're immediately ready to go into phase two. And I guess final thoughts are that um, by centering climate concerns, and building as fast as we can. The tribe has seemed 
seemed to arise at just the right moment with the appropriate resilience infrastructure. In reality, the success um, here is a result of planning and moving as fast as possible to deploy climate smart solutions. Um, by doing this, the tribe is creating a just, equitable transition um, to a climate smart community. And that really is working in all the ways that we've discussed, socially and economically, um, all at the same time. I've also included uh, um, in the um, slides that I sent, and maybe um, we can um, get those slides out to the participants today, but there's some microgrid development resources, some other links, and some further reading resources um, that if they're not available in this particular PowerPoint, I can provide to anyone that's interested. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jana. So I will be speaking a little bit more on the value of energy efficiency and renewable energy in action plans. Jana provided great information on the value of microgrids, calling them addictive. Uh, and the examples I gave from Puerto Rico and Florida showcase the value of energy efficiency and renewable energy. Next, I will walk through how valuable these technologies are. And for those interested, can be incorporated into the CDBG MIT action plans. The energy sector is cross-cutting in that it not only powers our homes, but can help power critical facilities such as hospitals, police fire stations, or shelters, more energy efficient building demands, less power from the grid, and can help the backup generator during an outage, which also allows for energy resources to be utilized elsewhere. Energy efficiency increases the passive survivability of buildings and allows buildings to maintain habitable conditions in the event of a heating, cooling system loss. Efficient buildings, especially those that incorporate higher energy building code standards, will stay warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer. It can allow individuals to shelter in place during an event, potentially reducing morbidity and mortality. This is particularly important for residential buildings is also relevant for public buildings that might serve as community relief centers during an adverse event. Energy efficiency enhanced resilience to outages because buildings need less power to run during an outage. The strategy is pretty simple. When a critical public facility needs less energy to function, it also needs less backup generation on site to operate if the grid goes down. Energy efficiency improvements save money uh, especially by lowering energy bills year-round, and it carries other benefits including improved moisture, air quality, and it can even decrease energy burden. My colleagues at the U.S. Department of Energy will host a webinar dedicated to this topic and provide more information on buildings and energy efficiency on June 18th. Next, I will discuss renewable energy. It is important to note that energy efficiency measures are very powerful in terms of complementing on-site energy generation, such as solar and storage, um, they can significantly reduce the necessary size and cost of installing backup power systems, and can also increase the reliability of existing backup power in serving critical loads. Renewable energy technologies can mitigate against natural disasters and also contribute to resiliency. Solar technology paired with storage allows the power system to be resilient against natural disasters. It provides backup power and can support critical services during grid outages. These critical services were listed by Roosevelt during the community lifeline slide. Solar plus storage also allows for microgrid islanding. Uh, Jenna spoke nicely about it. That enables independent grid operations to provide power and reduce stress across the energy system. Using solar power to charge on-site energy storage offers facilities and homes the ability to continue to have power if the electricity grid goes down. There are other benefits of renewable energy, including low cost of solar electricity, 
uh, can decrease energy burden, reduce health and environmental impacts, uh, and also deliver supplementary benefits too. In addition, community solar can serve multiple off-takers, including households, businesses, nonprofits, and municipal sites. Integrating renewable technology into buildings and community centers can serve as a measure to mitigate against power outages while also serving as an emergency in times of need. The examples I gave on Puerto Rico and Florida are real-world examples of energy efficiency and renewable energy projects um, that we have seen that can increase resiliency and mitigate against a disaster. But before you have a project, you need a plan, which is why HUD requires CDBG MIT action plans. There are two examples of CDBG MIT draft action plans that incorporate renewable energy and energy efficiency. I believe it helps seeing examples of how peers are engaging in this space, in particular how peers are deciding to incorporate energy efficiency and renewable energy into their action plans. The development of action plans is a layered process, including public hearings and review. Um, and here are just two examples. California intends to leverage their 2019 building energy efficiency standards, which requires new construction of homes to include solar. The city of Columbia in South Carolina will promote high quality energy efficiency construction for all activities funded with CDBG MIT. These are just two examples, but it provides a nice snapshot on action plans and the energy lifeline. I want to make a note that reaching low to moderate income communities is important. And for those interested, can visit the DOE website where we have looked into energy burden and low income characteristics. For example, DOE hosts a web-based tool called Low Income Energy Affordability Data Tool, also known as LEAD, which helps identify where low income areas are in the nation, down to the county and census level. Now with that, I'll hand it back over to Roosevelt to wrap up with a summary and take takeaways of the presentation. Okay, thank you, Crystal. So I would like to thank Michaela, Crystal, Dana, uh, for your webinar presentation today. Um, and I would like to remind everyone that today's webinar is being recorded and that we will post the webinar recording today's slides and a transcript after a 508 compliance review onto to the HUD exchange. Uh, just quickly trying to recap some of the wonderful things that were discussed. Uh, on slide 11, there was discussion by Michaela that looked at the mitigation plan and how that connects to your mitigation needs assessment. The mitigation plan covers, covers hazard identification, looks at your natural hazards or other risks, assesses those risks, and then allows you to develop your mitigation strategy. As you're building your action plan and looking at that mitigation needs assessment, you can leverage some of that analysis in terms of vulnerabilities, and then also develop your mitigation strategy. And then prioritize your funds to address those particular vulnerabilities. We talked about that mitigation needs assessment capturing current and future risk and how that's a, a key component. We talked about community lifelines, and they essentially are basic functions necessary to allow a community to function. Um, and then we talked about how these uh, community lifelines tend to intersect, particularly energy. Both Jana and Crystal kind of uh, noted that cross-cutting uh, connection. Energy lifelines uh, include power generation or that grid, that backup power and fuel. And a grantee looking at developing their, their mitigation needs assessment uh, needs to assess potential for vulnerability, especially after a major event. So with that being said, uh, Michaela also talked about the four HUD goals connected, connected to CDB, CDBG MIT. And so from here, I'd like to talk about the value, again, connecting to what Crystal said, the value of connecting energy efficiency and renewable energy in your action plan. So goal one, data-informed investments to detect against repetitive loss of property. Uh, both uh, Crystal and Jenna spoke to that. 
Crystal mentioned the Florida Sun Smart E shelters or emergency shelters. She also talked about the Puerto Rico Energy Resilience Project. Uh, Jana mentioned the Low Carbon Resilience Package, uh, which also certainly underscores the importance of solar uh, and storage. For goal two, building capacity to co comprehensively analyze disaster risk. That's what I've been speaking to in terms of the value of that mitigation plan, incorporating that information into your mitigation needs assessment for your action plan. Anna spoke about the tribal resilience planning, that's a strategic energy planning that uh, they've done. Uh, and I think she also talked about that low carbon resilience project that may connect with that as well. For goal three, looking at uh, using local and regional priorities that will have lasting effects to drive down future disaster costs, promote risk reduction, and promote community lifelines. Again, uh, just the discussion that uh, Jana in particular had on the community scale microgrids uh, provides some information to that. And then also to Crystal's discussion about the use of solar uh, with Florida and Puerto Rico applied. Last, we have goal four, which is that encouraging private and public partnerships. Uh, again, using some information from Jana, using a whole community approach, smartly leveraging funding, and then certainly looking at promoting that public and private partnerships. And so Humboldt State, she called that out in particular, and they're being able to the blue, uh, the blue Rancher, Lake Rancheria tribe being able to pull that information in. Also, too, Jana spoke about the importance of connecting with your utility to ensure information sharing and to build that strategic partnership. So with that, um, I'd like to just quickly go through these resources. Um, so I mentioned how that we have uh, the August Federal Register Notice that lays out CDBG MIT. And then we also have a link here for the webinar series uh, that the uh, team focused on last year in terms of being able to look at CDB, CDBG MIT and some of those particular requirements. In particular, uh, Frank and Jen led a webinar in September that focused on CDB, CDB MIT itself, the requirements, and then also covered projects. There are a number of FEMA resources here that we recommend that you consider, including these that focus on mitigation planning and looking into leveraging that vulnerability assessment into your mitigation needs assessment of your action plan. We talked about the community lifelines, and that is contained in that national response framework. Here are several DOE energy efficiency and, re and renewable energy resources. We have a fact sheet. We have information for state and local leaders connected to energy efficiency and renewable energy. We have information on resilience and building better buildings. And we have case studies. Again, I want to thank Jana. I want to thank Crystal and Michaela for all of their information. Um, we will be posting these slides, the recording of the webinar, and a transcript at a later date. I'm going to make sure that we have all resources uh, available to you for that as well. Here's some contact information, as you can see in the blue. And here is also an email to the HUD policy unit where you can ask questions at drsipolicyunit at hud.gov. Again, drsipolicyunit at hud.gov. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Michaela for any potential questions. Hey, everyone. Um, so we do not currently have any questions in our question boxes. So just a reminder, if you guys have a question, type it in the, the chat box, and we will do our best to get all of your questions answered. Um, so I'll give us a few minutes to see if we get some questions coming in.
Okay, so one of the questions that have been asked is, are there an energy benchmark for energy efficiency? So Crystal, do you want to take that one? Yes. So that's a good point. You always need to do some sort of baseline when you're doing a project. So energy efficiency benchmarking is uh, a way to do that. I believe that, and this is something that HUD can help correct me, you may be able to use some of your funds to do that, but uh, we do it at Department of Energy through just different mechanisms in order to showcase the results of doing energy efficiency. And I believe my DOE colleagues in June will also cover energy efficiency much more in depth. So I do encourage you to, to be on that webinar as well. Okay, great. Thank you, Crystal. It looks like we have another question for DOE that's asking for some information on battery storage options and standards. That's a great question. I think Jana might be best to answer that since she actually was on the ground doing the specs for it. So I'll actually punch it over to her. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry, will you repeat the, the full question for me? Yes. Um, so the question is, are there um, some, some battery storage options and, and what are typical standards for battery storage? Um, the standards question, I think, um, I'm not sure kind of what the technical context is for standards, but the types of battery technologies that are available are, um, uh, you know, we, we chose lithium ion batteries. Um, we've worked with Tesla. Um, and there are reasons for that within a microgrid in that um, the, the batteries function um, for energy storage and dispatch um, really well. They have, they have um, a good control system and their uh, um, interconnection with our microgrid um, is, while it wasn't seamless, we had some, you know, some engineering and development work that we did with Tesla. Um, they are very, they're very robust once they're up and running. Um, they also had, for I guess the purposes of comparing and contrasting, they had 10-year um, warranties and um, a, a fairly, you know, in the, and it's a fairly robust warranty in terms of um, um, annual maintenance and that kind of thing that was that was included. Um, the other battery technologies, there's all kinds of battery technologies. There's, there's flow, there's um, different, different technologies are being developed right now. And I mainly know about lithium ion. I don't know about the other ones, although we did canvas, our engineering teams did canvas those at the start of the project. Now, the caveat to that is that um, you know, these things are changing so rapidly that, that year to year it's good to keep yourself updated. So I'm not sure that this is incredibly helpful, but um, battery storage is one of those really dynamic uh, technologies right now. Um, and we are going to have a lot more um, commercial size availability um, uh, next year than we do today. But Already, there's starting to be other technologies that are coming to um, commercial viability. And I can provide um, some documentation uh, to those that are interested if they want to email me. Thank you, Jana. Um, so our next question, I think, is probably for you, Crystal. Um, and that is, 
is there a solar panel rating site? Thanks for that. So not really. Um, so the solar industry, depending on who you talk to, will be recommending different solar panels for your geographical location. I mean, what's great about solar is that just depending on your needs, you can find really good providers, but providers, I mean, is industry and developers that can fit the need that you're looking for. And that, that itself will help you understand what kind of panels you would need. I will say this, that solar panels have gotten, have become far, far superior in the last five years. At the Department of Energy, we actually, on our, on our roof and headquarters in Washington, D.C., we, we have the solar panels there, and we actually show from several years ago the difference of solar panels and how efficient they be, and, and how superior they are in, in just by, by year time frames. So right now, solar electricity is fairly cheap. It's the installation and obviously the soft cost, which can often be an expensive portion of it. Um, I will say this, too. Solar panels have been certified to withstand very high amounts of wind, um, sometimes up to 140 miles per hour, so certain hurricane categories. Um, and obviously, of course, depending on your location, would be a prominent type of uh, solar panel for your, you and your decision um, when it comes to the project. Thanks, Crystal. It looks like we have answered most questions in our chat box. So we'll give it a few more minutes. Gina, do you want to briefly discuss um, the, the, the wind um, and pairing with microgrids? I'm sorry, the, did you say wind power? Yes, um, so pairing microgrids with wind. Oh, sure. Um, well, I mean, wind will be just like solar uh, in that it is an intermittent um, resource. Depending on the type of wind resource available in any given, on any given site, um, it could in fact be more, um, more of a base load power source in that, of course, you know, the wind can blow day or night, um, <laughs> uh, depending on, of course, the site. And so um, it's the same basic principle as incorporating solar in that um, it will likely make sense to investigate some energy storage along with wind power in a microgrid, um, just so you have more control over when you um, more control over the, the um, dispatch of that power. You can level it out as compared to when it's generated. So in our microgrid, obviously, we capture as much storage, as much solar power as possible, and then we use it um, in normal operation to, um, to, to our economic advantage. Um, which also eases pressure on the grid. So we will use solar power um, in the evening um, through our batteries when in California we see the tail end of the duck curve. 
um, where the sun's going down and the power load is coming up and those two things do not match until you put sto uh, storage in there so you can dispatch it when you need it. Um, same would be true with wind. You would just capture um, the wind energy to a great degree um, in the batteries or in, in the other storage mechanism that, that you would have, and then you would use it um, when you need it in your system. And I'll just add that, that wind, just like solar panels, wind um, infrastructure is dramatically reducing in price. And so solar um, and wind energy generation um, for new systems are um, the most cost effective um, or close to the most cost effective energy generation um, that we can invest in. Thanks, Jana. Um, Crystal, could you um, explain a little bit more about what informs the availability of the state energy program uh, annually that states can apply for? Absolutely. So, Similar to how the CDBG HUD funds were provided to the state, and then the state decided which office would then be responsible for the funds, that's the same as the state energy program. So when we provide funds to the state, they decide where to, to put the money in terms of the office. Oftentimes it's called the Office of Energy, but depends on how it's situated depending on the state or the, the territory commonwealth. Um, what I would recommend, if you are interested in communicating with your office and that you are not currently in an office that hosts the SVP funds, reach out to me and I can connect you with our point of contact. It's just different mechanisms of providing funding from the federal agency. It's similar with FEMA, too. It's a federal emergency management organization or agency where their funds go to the hazard mitigation office. Thanks, Crystal. Would you also want to answer a question that we have received? It says, does DOE have any best practices um, and examples of co-generation or tri-generation projects? Absolutely. So I'm assuming that means combined heat and power, and feel free to just put in the chat if you mean something else. And yes, we do. I didn't get into that too much because I was focused just on energy efficiency and renewable energy. But so combined heat and power for folks, um, it's when you have uh, one generation, but then it also is utilized as a second form of generation two. So we have seen a lot of great best practices, and we do, and I'll add this to the resource slide that we have here. We actually did a two-year program called, I'm going to butcher it, so it was focused on resiliency and combined heat and power, where we worked with different stakeholders to understand what they were doing in that space. Um, a really great example is from Montgomery County in Maryland. Uh, and they actually are focusing on low and moderate income communities too. So they are, are one of the pioneers that are focusing on combined heat and power. And they're also trying to build out um, a microgrid as well. So there are a lot of different examples, a lot of different information on our website on it. Um, and I'm happy to put that resource on the resource page. Thanks, Crystal. All right, that looks like we have addressed most of the questions. Roosevelt, do you want to go ahead and close this off? Sure. So again, I'd like to thank Crystal Lehman, who is with the Department of Energy, Energy Efficiency, and Renewable Energy. Thank you so much for your slides. We also appreciate Jana Canyon, uh, who certainly represents the Blue Lake Rancheria tribe, 
Um, and again, as a nationally recognized leader in energy efficiency and renewable energy. Thank you, Michaela, as well. Um, this is the first webinar in the CDBG MIT series that Jim spoke, about, spoke of. We do plan to have future DOE-related webinars, as Crystal mentioned. Next one coming up is on June 18th. That will focus on energy efficiency and renewable energy as it relates to buildings. Um, we do plan to have a third DOE webinar that will focus on electricity. Uh, from there, uh, we will continue to have uh, CDBG MIT series webinars, and we'll continue to post that. And we'd like you to stay tuned for that. So with that being said, I'd like to thank everyone for, for participating. Thank you for the great questions, and we'll see you soon. Your conference is ending now. As requested by the host, please hang up.